I'm a, I'm a terrible, terrible naturalistic writer. It might, my dialogue makes me laugh, and not in a nice way. You know, it's just, it's not good. So I stay in the realm of comedy and absurdity because it's where I feel the most comfortable. It's kind of where I live. It's kind of my life. You know, my life isn't really very natural. It's sort of supernatural, though no, it's really, really unnatural. Um, I have braces now. Is that awful? I can hardly talk. So a typical year, which would have been last year, um, we st I had to write notes because he was so busy. He started in Toronto directing at Canadian Stage, a play by Richard Greenberg, Take Me Out. Went directly to Vancouver to direct the premiere of his most recent play of the time, which was a year ago, The Dishwashers. Uh, came back to the side of the country to the Shaw Festival to do You Never Can Tell, which was a big, huge hit. Went to Paris right after that for the opening of, of his play Vigil in French in Paris. Came back to Toronto to do a play uh, called Habeas Corpus directed The Dishwashers in Toronto at the Tarragon Theatre, and then, in the middle of all of this, adapted The Government Inspector, and then directed that, and uh, went immediately after that straight out to Vancouver again to direct Waiting for Godot, all the while developing What Lies Before Us and two other things that he's got in the pipe. So here I'm trying to write this play about some guys, you know, who are waiting for a captain, the American captain, to come and meet them on this expedition in the middle of the Rockies. So he's never stops and he's usually multitasking in terms of the writing and you know he and his design partner Ken are working on some opera stuff that they'd like to do. It's all very early stages. <laughs> The schedule of what lies before us and the schedule of visual, we both start rehearsals the same day, we both open practically the same time. It runs a little longer here in Toronto and so we will be able to come and see it, which is great, I can't wait to see it on stage. Very weird first show I've ever not been around of Morris's for opening night. So I can't be around when what lies before us is opening. But this is a perfect example of how you can drop the ball because I have no clue what's going on anywhere at any one time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a little confusing. It's extreme and it's ongoing and there's no sign of it stopping. I've written 20 plays and it's the, it's the first time I've ever not directed and not even been around. And, and so it's terrifying for me. To me, what's really important in a dramaturgical process is you sort of build a language with your playwright. And I think Morris and I are still getting to know each other. The guy who's directing it, Jim, I don't know anything about him, really. I mean, I've seen a couple of things he's directed, and they're good, but, you know, who knows? He might completely f the material up. My notes from last fall when we did it were, you know, just about a few places that maybe you could, there was opportunities to, if you have ideas of other things you'd like to touch on in the show after you hear it a couple more times, I saw opportunities where you could go in and expand things. There was little things in the story and, and the things they started to talk about that I thought, oh, I'd like to hear more about that. Can you give me an example? No, because I'm shallow and I don't show, remember. You don't you're talking yeah, about. I'm just uh, here. <laughs> so if I'm not around, I don't know what's going to happen. This is going to be a whole new experience, having a play happen while I'm not there, like the first production. Why are you so fascinated by old people? It's because I'm fascinated by death. My dad just died about a month ago, and um, that was very hard, and everybody was very tearful except my mother. She was like, she suddenly, her, her whole um, 
sense of absurdity came pouring out of her in a weird way. Like I would try to talk about dad and I would start crying and she'd say, hang in there, Morris, hang in there. And it was so weird. I thought it was quite lovely that Morris put a, uh, I think he may have told you that, I don't know, he put a, a lottery ticket in his hand because his Morris' dad was a big, big gambler, lottery fanatic and horse races and loved uh, games and sports. They said, somebody has to witness the cremation. And I said, I, I have to do that. That has to be my job. So he's fascinated by death. Well, what's more important, life and death? You know, like it's, it's the big question, isn't it? And I put a lottery ticket in his hand that I found in my pocket. It was uncashed lottery ticket. I mean, I don't know. I didn't even check the numbers. It was so funny because afterwards, everybody in my family, I mean, it's so unreal. They were all going, why did you put that lottery ticket in his hand? What if it was a winner? And you're going, well, wouldn't that be f great? Anyway, so... I shut the lid and we, me and the guy wheeled him to the, Ken came too, we wheeled him to the crematorium. One of my brothers came with me. And we went and it, this cardboard box casket sort of raises up and pushes into this furnace basically and you push a button and boom. As James Taylor says, back into the storm. It was that kind of Ukrainian, you know, Greek Orthodox, you know, the funerals lasted for five days. Even Christmas was a bummer, you know? It came later and it had a lot of incense. He grew up with all of that. I think he's told me that it comes back to some funeral he went to of his, maybe his grandmother or something, when he was a kid, like five or six years old, and, and people, it was a big Ukrainian funeral, people sort of throwing themselves and wailing over the coffin. And I think the, I think the high drama of it you know, even as he was a little boy, really s stuck with him. That's the Calgary Zoo. I must be about, I must be about three there. That's my grandmother. Um, she took me to the zoo. Look at that bear. That bear could like eat me for dessert. And then never forget what prairie winters are like. They're cold, they're bleak, they're desolate. That's what nourished Panitch. But then when he was ready to burst out as an artist, it was in that Garden of Eden called Vancouver, you know, where like everything's okay, man, like everything's wonderful. So from repression to liberation, with also little sidelines off in England studying as well. London was like so fantastic. It was such a neat place. There were so many neat people and it was like a, I could be so anonymous there and I could be anybody and I would pretend I was people. And I spent like two weeks once pretending I was from Texas and, and I, and then I I met a guy in a bar who was a priest who would give me five pounds a week to talk dirty to me and stuff like that that was just great, you know. And he'd say, is this all right? I can talk dirty to you. And I'd say, yeah, go ahead, just uh, buy me another beer. And then he'd give me five pounds <laughs> at the end of our session. <laughs> and um, some friends of mine were appalled that I was doing that. But you know, when you need money in London, you need money. As it was, I was stealing milk from people's porches and. I mean, I was just up to no good. So I had to get out of there. So uh, I got on a flight to New York, and I tried to stay in New York for a while, but I couldn't because I didn't have a, you know, whatever it's called, green card. I tried to join the armed services. I thought, if, I, if I'm willing to join the armed services, they'll let me stay because I want to be an actor. I got two job offers in my first three days in New York but I couldn't stay because of this green card shit. So I ended up back in Vancouver because I knew I had some old friends and um, it was, you know, I hate to say it, but Vancouver was kind of a default position. You know, London, New York, Montreal, Toronto. Vancouver, okay. I'm not going any further. I'm not going to Prince George. I've got to make it here. We've been together since 1980 and we've worked together that whole time. I came back and I met Ken and sort of hung around here and started to really like being with Ken and started to like being in Vancouver. Well, Morris and Ken are certainly um, joined uh, uh, very, very closely, obviously in real life as well as uh, on the stage. And uh, Ken is perhaps his, his um, biggest critic, uh, certainly the person he will listen to first before anyone else. I mean, I can offer my notes uh, and sometimes he throws them in the, you know, the trash can. But if something that I said uh, Ken agreed with, then it becomes a note that Morris will listen to. Can you try something for me? Say your lines. You're just back there, right? Just say your lines. Don't even look at him. Say all your lines out to us. As if you're talking to him, but like, it's like a vaudeville.
We just celebrated our third official anniversary and our 27th year of uh, not being married. <laughs> I spent most of my youth trying to, well, at least when I became conscious of my sexuality, that doesn't really happen until you get to be 11 or 12 and stuff like that. Um, before that, I was just, I just knew I was different. You know, I w walked around in, I mean, it's classic stuff. I walked around in my mother's high heels. I, you know, danced little ballets in the, in the rumpus room to sort of nutcracker suite. I rolled around naked on my mother's, you know, bearskin coat when she wasn't at home. Um, I was, uh, I baked little cakes, you know, I learned how to do inseaming for dolls' dresses. I was just a fag in waiting. But, you know, you don't really think about that stuff. You just, you know, and, 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 I, and, and you know, my parents were really good about it, too. They were really kind of, kind of a little bit laissez-faire. There was only a couple of times when my mother would get stern with me and say, you know, things that were just now that I think of them were incredibly comical. Like, she'd say, this is your last doll. We were doing uh, summer stock in, in, in White Rock, B.C., um, doing 18 wheels, John Gray's 18 wheels. And we, we would sort of sing in the car on the way out. It was a half-hour drive. So we back, and Morris one day said, I, I think we can write a musical. When I remember that day, and I sat down, and I started to write a bunch of lyrics for an imaginary musical about a guy in a nuclear war. I had gone out shopping, and I came back, and on the piano downstairs, Morris had put, a, a, like, basically a poem, a lyrics to this song. He said, I I've written some lyrics and uh, you should write a song. I said, I've, I've, never, I've never written any music. You gotta write the music. He says, I, c I can't do that. And I said, you gotta write them. You got a piano, go. So he kind of moaned and he's a Taurus, you know. So he just kept putting these lyrics on the piano. We was talking about that and I, and I wrote about 12 songs. We showed it to Tamanus Theater at the time in Vancouver and they liked it and said, if you finish this, we'll put it on. And that was it. That was the beginning. So he wrote this wonderful story about a, a, an escaped convict named Bartholomew Gross that he played, and myself, Eddie Morosa, a blinded piano player, and how they meet up, and he, at gunpoint, I'm forced to put on a, a cabaret and play the piano for him, and he puts it on for the, the, the dead folks of the world. We took these eight songs to Taminus, and we played them, we, we performed the eight songs, and they really loved them, and they said, well, you need to come up with a story now, but we'll do this thing. We'll do it. So we went home and I was sick for eight days, like literally sick. And I, it was completely because I was terrified. Suddenly I went, I laid down on the sofa and went, I can't get up. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to now come up with this f play. But I pulled myself out of bed after like eight days and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, we did it in Vancouver, then we did it in Toronto. We crossed Canada, we made a CBC special of it. Should sure, life get you down when you were on the town? You, you could, could always go to some little place. Sunset and bowl through the park, but never after dark. Never in my life have I experienced anything like that. Opening night was huge. It was like the thing you dream about. And I think it set me up in a good way because at least, I think there's nothing worse than having one hit. You gotta have two. <laughs> you just got it. There's a paralyzed guy and a guy with a a broken leg with a knife in it. That's a difficult, uh, that's not going to be a ballet. I'm going to continue with my song. Oh, joy. <laughs> her name was Melinda. I saw her last night. She stood in the window beneath the moon, moon, moon. I'm talking about a certain kind of history of Canada and a certain kind of viewpoint, but people, I think, would misunderstand this play if they thought that I was talking about the history of Canada. I'm talking about um, a condition. I'm talking about a human condition of two people stuck together, and I'm using the subject of, or three people stuck together in the wilderness. I'm using the subject of the. Of a, of, a, of, of a phony historical event to, to bring focus to that. But this, as I say, the event, the event is phony. There, this didn't happen. There weren't two surveyors and a Chinese guy stuck in the middle of the Rockies. It's, a, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a joke. 
Um, and it's supposed to be a comedy, too. Isn't Melinda the one who gave you syphilis? It's a romantic reinterpretation. I think the biggest challenge is to, in something that's kind of, could be described as a black comedy, is to make sure that the characters are rooted in a, in a, a really good reality that allows the comedy to occur, but they don't have to play the comedy. Winda is not a word. I know it's not a word. I'm aware of that rather obvious, boring fact. Songs don't use words, they use lyrics. I can't say window unless her name is Melindo. So there goes your stupid theory. Perhaps instead of the window, she could be standing in the door. Then you could say <laughs> she was a whore. But you know, people, uh, people sometimes they take these things so fucking seriously. You know, they're looking for meaning in every possible thing, and sometimes there just isn't any. The themes emerge from the characters, not we submit the characters to our thematic interpretation. I think, I think Morris. Um, could summarize it very pithily. Uh, I'd prefer to uh, explore how these guys are trapped together. Uh, and I do think it's a little bit no exit. I do think it's certainly a bit Godot. Uh, hell is other people, and it's hilarious. Morris Panitch doesn't just write plays, he creates worlds. And in these worlds, there's always one scene where you suddenly sit there and go, I got it, that's what you meant. There is an absurdist element to it that makes him really unique, and I think he speaks in that voice in, an, in almost a non-Canadian way. He is a, glo I, I call him our global playwright, because I think that the themes and the ideas that he talks about um, can play anywhere in the world. I think that absur absurd, sort of dark uh, theme that runs through his plays is something anybody anywhere in the world can relate to. I set out not to be specific. I, I set out to pick a theme or an idea that is actually, will touch a lot of souls. The Everyman theme really is central to his plays. Uh, again, from Seven Stories, where he calls his character Man, with a capital M, uh, through Vigil, this little nowhere man. And you see it especially, I think, in The Overcoat. The Overcoat, which is, if you think of it, a bizarre idea. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't we do a movement-based play, not with dancers, but with actors? We'll base it on Gogol's short story of The Overcoat, throw in a bit of, uh, you know, a Diary of a Madman, and we'll set it all to the music of Shostakovich. If it wasn't for people like, like, I look at him and I go, yeah, Morris, that's fantastic, whatever you want to do. But I think that by and large, can he, we're a little cautious. You know, I think the ideas that Morris comes up with are crazy, but he delivers, you know, it, it, he delivers on everything he says. Marty is a big, big backer of that show, actually. I mean, you may have thought it was a crazy idea to start with, and it was a crazy idea, um, but it's been very successful. I think the wonderful thing about Morris is, is how he surprises. Um, it surprises me. Uh, I, I, I never, um, I never assume that I'm, I'm going to know what is in his plays when, when I start reading them. All of Panitch's heroes, if you want to use that term, are looking for what their existence really means. To me, the thrill about something like Vigil is that it does, that people can pull out of it the same meaning or a similar meaning in all these different countries. But when you look at the face of it, that play is really about the most fundamental of ideas. It's about need. It's about, um, it's about a lack of love and love. All those things, I mean, everyone understands them. In all of Panitch's plays, people are reaching out to connect, and it's those moments we look for. Somebody holds out a hand, and somebody either goes like that, or somebody goes like that, or somebody goes like that. Because Panitch isn't sentimental, uh, but he is always about a moment where two people try to connect. If you look at the world uh, with the idea that people are born to die, there's really no other thing to think about. Like, that's a big dichotomy. That's a big issue in my head. I think Morris's original voice is, first of all, um, he has a dark sense of the world. Uh, maybe that isn't particularly original. Lots of people have dark senses of the world. But what he does is couple it with, a, with an absurd sense of, of the comedic, uh, that we're all sort of on a ledge, uh, like the man is in Seven Stories. We're all sort of facing death, uh, similar to that man. It's like a big, mean joke. 
Is that what you want people to take away from your place? Is it one big mean joke? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. But it also, once you've got big mean joke, then what have you got? You can go around, you know, kvetching about it, but there are other things to consider. There are other possibilities. And that's when you start to, when, you're, when your thoughts start to grow and your ideas start to grow and you become, um, and it becomes necessary for you to, to consider what other things there are to do while you're waiting um, and while you're, you know, living in this uncomfortable and inevitable situation. You know, I mean, you, you, in some cases, some of my characters do sit and complain and that's all they do. In others, they try to act. And sometimes they act in negative ways and sometimes they can act in positive ways. But it's pretty much the same picture all the time. It's pretty much people trying to cope one way or another with that reality. I think it's the combination of bleakness and humor, bleakness and wit, bleakness and thematic intelligence and theatrical intelligence. Um, his best plays really, you know, put all these things together in a very um, theatrically efficient package. The one thing I have learned is that things do get better if you work on them enough, you know, because like if you write a really good play, like say Vigil is a really good, I think Vigil is a really good play and it's solid. And what backs me up isn't just me, it's being done everywhere and people love it and it, you know, so it's not just me. Um, but then when I sit down to write a play after it, I have to judge it against Vigil. And so my first draft is never gonna match it. Uh, and, and it just, it's terrifying because then you go, I'm the world's shittiest writer. How did I pull that off? How did I actually even write Vigil? I don't even know how I did that. And then you remember, through time, Vigil was an absolute piece of garbage for months and months. There were so many stupid loopholes in it, and it was terrible. And if I actually remember correctly, there was a workshop where there were three characters in it. In fact, Joan McLeod said I should have three characters in it, which just goes to show you what a genius she is. Yeah, I saw it in, in Czech, I think. This guy from Prague tends to do it, like in Prague, but he came to Vancouver. It's a credit to the actors that I understood everything that they were doing. <laughs> I didn't know it was in Czech, and I didn't understand a word. I understood the emotions of it. So I saw it in Czech, I saw it in Paris, I saw it in London in the West End, uh, which was a terrible production. The Guardian eventually voted it the worst play of 2002, I think, which is, you know, a real honor. When you think of how many plays there are in London, to pick it out of 600 plays, it's, wow, I, I, I'm impressed. Vigil, in fact, uh, you know, was embraced by the Brits for a while because they were convinced it was quintessentially English, you know. Uh, the French are after it now. They think it's very French, you know. I'm sure somewhere there's a Bulgarian playwright, a Bulgarian theater critic saying, Morris Panitch is so Bulgarian. Suddenly, out of this comes, like, requests from every country in Europe to do this play in their own language. So far, it's been done in uh, France, in Spain, in Israel, in Poland, in Bulgaria. That would, that's like, you might as well stamp, kill this writer now on my forehead. sent me, remember, all that time ago? The one that brought me here? The one that said, I'm dying? Not that I'm keeping you to your word, but it's hardly the sort of thing you change your mind about. Father. Is it? Fuck. But it's hardly the sort of thing you change your mind about, is it?
I don't listen to anybody. Like that's why we got talking about Jim the other day because we had set up this thing where we were I working that, together. I'm, I'm right? gonna try and rewrite that so it sounds a little bit less um, on the nose. Yeah, if you know what I mean. I do. And things like that. In terms of expanding, I I, I know what you mean, and I, but I have to be very careful because I don't want to overdo it. Well, exactly, because you don't want these to become modern characters with, uh, you know, funny colonial outfits on. Right. Exactly. It doesn't even even remotely reflect how I work with directors because first of all I usually direct so I don't have a conversation with a director about my writing in the second place with very few exceptions I'm really not interested in what a director has to say about my work I'm not I'm more interested in what Ken has to say about it or people close to me or or, or my own instincts and I've done enough theater now that I think I I think I know I what I well, want it's quite you could easily just Go like that, and then fold yeah. back in there again. I'm not loving that idea. No? no. Oh, because I think it would. Well, you're not. It's this high. You're not going to be climbing over because it's all going to be like. It's not. It's not this high. You know what I mean? It's right. that high. No, no. But I'm thinking just. Um, tr try this for me. Like just, just say so you come around here. You say the line here, the boy your age sign, and then you. When say, you've I'll take done enough plays and you've seen it done enough. You realize that there is, you know, every play has a way of being done. It does make you, again, not really sure what it is you're doing. And, and uh, I, you know, I hate to admit that because it's like with my directing. When I walk in a room, the, w the worst and most mortifying moment for me is when everybody finally realizes that I actually have no f clue what I'm doing. And I can say it. And that's my, that usually what I, the first thing I say. I say, I have no clue what I'm doing. And they all go, <laughs> That's so comical. And then they find out that actually is what I meant. And so the horror hits them smack in the face like a ton of shit. The, about a week in, this guy has no clue what he's doing. He's making it up on the fly, blah, blah, blah. And I used to think, is that right? Maybe I should know more. And then I think, no, not really. I mean, you take in with you what you have and then you make adjustments. Since um, Morris and I were going over the script in the springtime, uh, I would describe the process as a, a fine-tuning process. I think he's gone through it with a pretty fine-tooth comb and clarified, uh, uh, chose his, chosen his words and, and, uh, and uh, helped, uh, helped prune almost the, uh, the text, but it's, uh, it's very much very similar to what we had. I'm sort of simultaneously working on like four projects. So to accurately reflect what's going on while this show is <clears throat> going towards production is, and to say I'm actually working on it would be kind of slightly misleading. I'm, I'm, I am working on it, but I'm working on it in tandem with three other projects. I've got a, I've got a, um, uh, <clears throat> I've just developed and sold to Warner Brothers uh, a script called Damnation, a pilot script, which I'm working on. In fact, I'm just waiting for them to, to call me with their notes um, because it's been uh, shortlisted by Fox to be made into a pilot. So I'm crossing my fingers, but that's, a, that's taken up an enormous, since I talked to you last, it's taken up an enormous amount of my uh, focus. Um, not so much because of the money, actually. Uh, the money is some... Um, good but you know it's not crazy good like crazy actor money it's sort of writer money but it's I mean it's and I'm not complaining by any means but it's like it's like it's them they they call me constantly. Morris was going to Los Angeles a, a lot to talk to Fox and to Warner Brothers about this um, pilot that he had written that they were very interested in. The Warner Brothers pilot started to draw me away from the other work because and then this very funny thing happened that well I'm sure you won't find it very amusing, but um, we came back here to direct Blythe Spirit at Soul Pepper, Ken and I. We packed up everything and came back here to start rehearsal on uh, October the 1st, but we got the year wrong. And I didn't really check my email, so it was kind of a major f up for us. It, it, it like, kind of funny, but kind of not funny, because it really is, shows how tragically out of touch we are with reality but also um, that we, have, we had no money. And like, you know, uh, we had a serious cash flow problem. I don't know if you've been around the house, but we did a renovation 
and uh, it costs quite a lot of dosh. And we, so we ended up going practically into the poorhouse thinking, well, we'll have this job coming up in, in, um, in October. But of course, the job didn't materialize because there was no job. It was, it's next year. So now I'm thinking, oh, f now I have to do it next yeah. year. I think it maybe has to stand up almost straight like this, but not even see, but that still yep. looks. Yep. So looks, yeah. Because that's going to look like that. Yeah. And that's no, actually it's straight. Getting, it's not. Yeah, and you're still getting. Yeah. And that makes me wonder about the one on the side. Does it need to do something, you know, slightly the other way or not? The challenge is then your sight line from here starts to get cut off. Right. So the more you open that up, the more these. Okay, and, and it's better. I mean, I guess. I mean, this is deceiving right now. I'm just going to get yeah, okay. this because it's not really enough. I'm not sure why I hate it now. There's just something about the sheer density of it. Not the cold. I love the cold. No, it's the way people huddle together in masses, surviving on their own sickening warmth. If you look out over the city, if you look out over the city, I suppose, no, I, no. I've been trying to reform myself all the time um, <clears throat> around ideas or people or people or things that I like. Um, I try to work my way through different kinds of um, heroes that I have, like Pirandello and Ionesco and Beckett, and try to um, understand them and write through them, in a sense. He has a very strong worldview. Uh, it's not something you can pinpoint in a sentence and say, you know, life is wonderful or life is terrible. Again, try to pinpoint Samuel Beckett and Harold Pinter in one sentence or Eugenie Inesco. Uh, and I use these names not frivolously because I fully believe Panitch fits in with Pinter and Beckett and Ionesco. I have these instincts and I have these desires in ways to write and I have people saying, why does he write that way? Mazunian occasionally says it. Finally, I think when, he, when I did dishwashers, he said, well, maybe he's our Beckett or something. It was sort of like fantastically Canadian, like incredibly complimentary, but dismissive at the same time. Well, maybe he's our Beckett. And you go, okay, please, first of all, don't say our Beckett. That would, that's like, you might as well stamp, kill this writer now on my forehead. Because every other critic from then on goes, okay, let's just see how much Beckett there is in this guy. He has profound Canadian roots because I think if you scrape away, you will very much see someone who was brought up in a strict, probably oppressive background on the prairies. There's certainly a, a lot of uh, echoes of the existential, the great existential playwrights. I mean, Beckett, right from the beginning. Stylistically, morally, emotionally, he takes us on journeys through absurd comedy, through dark despair, and ultimately through profound existentialism. If if what lies before us is, is Beckett light, or Beckett like, or whatever, it won't be the first time it's been said about my work, and I just have to get over it, because if it's going to stop me from writing, if it's going to turn me into some magic realist who only does certain kinds of plays, because you know, then I don't want that. I think there's more. I think there can be more to my writing than, than you know, so far what I've explored. There's my, my long-awaited return of the stage and vigil, which could be a complete disaster, and then this new play. If everything goes to shit, it could be the worst January in my history, on top of unforeseen events. That's a transition we're going to pull I think it's a lot about us finding where these characters live and then more about the world they live in, uh, the actual physical environment of this tent. Um, because it's, especially in the second act, going to be difficult for it not to become static. I, I, think I think if you ask him the question, he can still... Ask him what question? As he just did, with the glasses, he goes, did you step on these? Did you step on these? Why do I need to get away from yeah. them, though? I didn't step on them. Exactly. Right. Um,
but what you always discover is once you get into rehearsal, uh, you know, a sort of second and third layer of questions or, or, or discoveries that you can't make until you're actually in the process of rehearsal of trying to make it live with actors. So that, that in the next couple of days, that's my big question for you. Tell me when it's gone too, right. too dark. To me, to me, he's a... And the, certainly the voice of Morris's voice in the play is very clear. So I think people will be interested. It's just a bit of a challenge. All it takes is one wonky choice, one bad bit of casting, one mistake. Are you still feeling suicidal? Like? And the whole thing could just go down the toilet. And in a big, big, splashy national way, because it's my wallet. Um, maybe that's symbolic. As I'm talking about the play, my wallet falls out of my pocket. There goes my future, my money. I heard the office, I heard that you were saying. I think he felt the pressure of um, just, of, of not being around, of, of, of talking to, to David and to Matt and to, yeah. Wayne, the people who were doing the show and talking to Jim, who was directing it, and just seeing how stuff was going, and there was, you know, there was some tension in certain bits, and it was, it was very, I think it was very hard for him not to be a part of that, you know. So, yeah, there were lots of phone calls, lots of emails, constantly, you know, what's happening, what's this, and and ideas, and can we cut this line if we do this? Right now in Toronto, I just went through a big up period, and now, boy, am I down. I'm on such a down cycle. I have critics eating oh. me alive. Somebody called me a malignant tumor the other day. This is like fantastically down. Like that's not just down, that's down and out. That's like, has he lost his touch, they're saying. So my vision for the fall, which was this glorious kind of path of, you know, success and, you know, laurels and accolades was just a complete nightmare one thing after the other, and then boom, my dad dies on top of everything else. It was just a spectacular autumn. I mean, Christ in heaven. And you know, you look at your horoscope and say, where's all this? I've been talking with him since, since Saturday night. And all day yesterday, I was on the phone with the actors, with the, with the artistic director, with the director, trying to figure out, you know, because they were concerned about how the show was going and everybody was freaking out. And, you know, and when you don't, when you can't see it, like, how, what do you know? You don't, I was so on the phone and people saying, okay, well, what do you think the problem is? And there's a, you know, like, and then different people giving different reports. Everybody from like the assistant designer, um, who said who was saying it was fine and it was funny, to you know other people who were saying it was a disaster. Nervous wreck, but he's Harry. I don't know. You know what my watch he, is? I think that he uh, he gets really concentrated and he and he get and he gets nervous and he gets hyper and all that kind of stuff. But he he calms down once he's once he's like on the stage, like everything is fine. I think it's that first second and being around him. It's been such a long time. As I say, it's only been twice in 12 years. You know that it used to be that. I think that I get more nervous. I want to know exactly what happens. So hopefully somebody in Toronto will call me. Oh, this is it. Jim, this is a call. Okay. Hello? Fine, thank you. So? I, I'm not one of these people who likes to, secrets kept from me. I don't even, you know, I read all the reviews and I want to know exactly what happens. So hopefully somebody in Toronto will call me just before I go on. The show is two hours, so if they open it, if they start at eight, yeah, then I should be hearing by seven o'clock before I have to actually start getting into makeup or whatever. So yeah, I'll, you know. Here it is, guys. Oh, this is it. Jim, this is a call. Okay. Hello? Fine, well, thank you. So? Uh-huh. 
it's the first time I've ever not directed and not even been around. In January, three things opening at once, only one, and one of them I'm acting in. The guy who's directing it, Jim, I don't know anything about him, really. All it takes is one wonky choice, one bad bit of casting, one mistake. Like that, did you do, did you do that first, that, that very opening that you were talking about? Like really going slow? And, and so what was the response at the end? I'm so relieved. I'm so relieved. And you got lots of laughs and stuff? <laughs> okay. Bye. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so relieved. <laughs> Everybody was mental on Saturday because the dress rehearsal was apparently not what everybody thought it should be. And I kept saying to them, guys, it's a dress rehearsal. Of course it's going to be horrible. Um, but they were all freaked out, so, oh my god, I'm so relieved. <laughs> so what's that, David? David, yeah. And so? He said there's lots of laughs, and, and the audience really got it. Oh! Oh, God. <laughs> that is... Oh. I can't tell you what today's been like. It's been just hell today. Plus, I think I had a bit of a hangover, so that didn't help. They did a lot of work today they, in rehearsal. They, they, they basically restructured the whole play. Right? Good. I cannot tell you how relieved I am that they actually got through it in one piece and didn't have, like, shit thrown at them. <laughs> I can't, I mean, believe me, I am so relieved. Now I can do this show in peace. Oh, oh here we go. Oh. Who's that? Hi. Hello? I did. I just wanted to know how it went. You can't direct and design every production. You have to give it over. So that's what we did. You know, I mean, constantly productions are being done of Morris's shows where we have no concept of what they look like, who's acting in them, or anything. This is just a, a different thing because of... Um, because this was a premiere, a world premiere. So, you know, we don't have any idea of how it's going to go at all. And then Marty says, I don't know what's going on. They're freaking out. They're freaking out. I, went, I said, now? He said, no, no, today they were freaking out. Said, Who was? The actors. Went, they were freaking out. Hello? <laughs> how do you put that out of your mind to go on with this? Oh, I just, that's why I got to stop now. Because I got, I got, um, what time is it? Oh, I've got 45 minutes, so I should be able to kind of like settle down. I mean, I knew it would be like this anyway, kind of. So, uh, I just have an indigestion from chili, so <clears throat> that's going to come back to haunt me about the middle of Act One. <laughs> <laughs> It'll like, be my chilly night. Although, I have to say, my first preview on Saturday, I had such bad indigestion, I thought I was going to barf. I think it was nerves. I was just really super nervous. I, I think that I get more nervous. I really, really think. And I've heard other people say that when their partners are on stage, they're more nervous. Ferociously handsome, misanthropic banker here. because we had a fight earlier because <laughs> I said he didn't care about me. <laughs> if you don't want to be compared to a candle, fine. In fact, maybe you're right. Why on earth should we compare ourselves to anything? I loathe metaphors anyway. What a stupid idea. You got a candle? <laughs> You're an old woman with dirty hair. If you were a candle, well. Oh, I never, never do it. So we're heading off to Toronto now. 
here to go see what lies before us and to rehearse Overcoat. I've yet to see what lies before us. There have been some rather strange reviews, so I'm very anxious to see. Yeah. The reviews are blaming Jim a lot, but also there is a, there, the general thrust of them is that it's not my best writing. Well, that's stupid. It's a good script. And I've, I wrote it five years ago. I've been working on it for five years. That was another thing that I found really offensive in the press. They were suggesting that I whipped it off, you know, because I'm prolific as if that's a crime. So, and uh, they don't know that I wrote that play five years ago, and it's been through about nine workshops. It's, uh, it's going to be very we're interesting. We're going to go on Tuesday night. We're going to go Tuesday night and see it. gave up our house in Vancouver to his sister and brother-in-law and cat and dog. There's, there's more opportunities here. And probably should have moved here maybe 10 years ago just to sort of get a kickstart. But I think we came with a little bit of a reputation and we came um, just uh, as we had, we had worked here one or two shows a year for so many years that finally went, oh, let's give it a chance and actually move here. Argue Kim about Blackwell's spot because she doesn't work here anymore. The reviews in the dailies, the, the, the weeklies were very good, but the dailies didn't like it at all and were very mean about it. And uh, so I was expecting to see some reflection of that, but I should know better because critics are notorious assholes and they get things wrong all the time. Got your ticket. Apparently, it's not selling out. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have done it this way. It would have been a very different production. I, I mentioned the music because uh, um, usually a, the music is a hallmark of my work. I, I choose my music very specifically to tell the audience right from the beginning that they're not watching naturalistic theater. But the acting was at the right level. I think that the actors were honest with each other. I think that the comedy came through without being pushed. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, Ken did the set, so you know we always worked together. So and I think he was quite pleased with what he saw tonight. One person's you know, ceiling is another person's floor. You know, you might go, somebody might love what you're writing and another person hate it, you know. So in the end, you have to decide, well, this is the art that I'm making. And if somebody, it's like if somebody paint, did a painting and then, you know, somebody would go, it's a tree. Why are you doing trees? And you go, well, because I'm doing trees. Trees is what I'm doing. <laughs>